Oni budú počínať. Tak, Hello everyone at the Center for Urban History. My name is Iva, uh, Sofia Diak and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mihail Fowler. Uh, she's a professor of, the, of history at uh, Stetson University, but also guest professor at the Department for Culture and Arts at the Ivan Franco University and also affiliated researcher at the Center for Urban History. Now, if, if I were to uh, enumerate all of our different collaborations, the, the evening would last into the night and probably into the morning, but um, I particularly want to mention uh, Mayhem's great uh, contribution to our educational uh, projects, uh, the summer school, the various collaborations and thinking on um, research, uh, and what the center is and what it can be, the great many collaborations, individual collaborations with colleagues, and and just the support uh, in various times, and especially now. Mayhul has written a book that we hope to see translated into Ukrainian this year. The book came out in Toronto uh, called Beaumont at the Edge of the Empire, the state and stage in Soviet Ukraine. Uh, Mayhill is currently working on a new book on women uh, of the Ukrainian theatre in the long 20th century and I suppose in some way the the story that Mayhill will share with us is part of that book. Um, however, this lecture is also part of the series that we've um, begun last year. It uh, took place on Zoom mainly last year. This year we're bringing it back uh, live and it's called Source as Choice. Um, the various documentation initiatives from last year have uh, moved us to think about how we work with sources. How does a source come about? What different choices uh, face us? Um, what different choices are behind the various sources that we choose, that we work with, that we interpret, that we have or that we don't have? And the protagonist of Mayhill's lecture has made many such choices, uh, which is what we'll be hearing about from Mayhill. Mayhill, the floor is yours. Uh, the lecture is in English, so we do have uh, our interpreter working. Uh, so help yourself to headsets, but we, we can later talk in either language. Uh, thank you very much, Sophia. Thank you so much for this invitation. I am so grateful to be here with you all and at the Center for Urban History, which has always been um, an intellectual home for me. I think I had my first fellowship here in 2009, um, and so it's very powerful to be talking about this new research in this very room where I've done so much teaching and so much talking um, and so much collaborating. So thank you all for being here. It is also very powerful to talk about these themes of theater, women, and war precisely here when war is going on in Ukraine. And I'm very aware of my own positionality, that I'm an American researcher, and it's one thing to talk about theater and trauma at home in Florida, and quite another to talk about it here. But I do hope that stories of the past help us understand the urgency of the present. About sources, last year I found that I was reading my sources about war in the past quite differently, simply because of what friends were experiencing here in war in the present. And sometimes when you have different circumstances while reading sources, you notice different things, or different aspects require investigation. The war has also changed archival access, and much of this talk is based on materials that are now digitized at the Babinyar uh, Foundation and Memorial um, Archive in, in Kiev. And my own practice has changed. I never, ever would have only worked with digitized documents. Um, I really believe as a historian that one has to work with the actual material paper in the place. Um, but here we are. And this is how we're working. Most of this talk is actually based on one source, and actually on one part of one source, which I have then contextualized, and I'll explain this shortly. 
And this is part of a larger project on women in theater in Ukraine, uh, now called Theater Women, Place and Performance in 20th Century Ukraine. So thank you for listening. I decided to be silent, states Dina Mstislavskaya, better known by her married name of Kronicheva, in the January 1946 Kyiv trials of 15 Nazi perpetrators. This moment occurs about halfway through the eight minute clip of her testimony from the trials, which one can now watch online on YouTube through the foundation in Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center. This is a photo from this trial. So having jumped into the ravine before the Germans began shooting, she then had to survive the soldiers' attempts to make sure that everyone was dead. She describes how a soldier stepped on her chest and her arm with his boots, but she made no sound. She says she decided to be silent. This extraordinary force of willpower should give listeners pause. How does one simply choose not to respond in such a harrowing moment? While medical studies may show the body's ability to survive moments of acute stress, still Kronicheva's ability to convince her potential murderers that she was dead demands some consideration. As a scholar of theater, when I was so struck by this moment in her testimony, I thought immediately of her career. Kronicheva was an actress. She was a trained theater professional who had worked in Kiev theater for over a decade, performing in the puppet theater, which of course required extreme mastery over her body. And so this talk sort of expands on this moment to suggest the ways in which analyzing Dina Pronicheva's life, not only as a survivor of Babinya, but also as a professional theater woman, opens up new questions about how we come to know the experience of war. Pronicheva is well known as one of the few survivors of Babinya. Her important testimony has been analyzed and has served scholars and courts for describing Nazi crimes in Ukraine. And often written in a phrase before or after her name is her profession, described as something along the lines of Soviet Jewish actress at the Kiev Puppet Theater. That's from Wikipedia, for example. The phrase downplays her profession, suggesting that theater is merely background information, a quirky side note, to the important biographical information, Holocaust survivor and witness. In fact, however, theater played a major role in Pronicheva's life, before the war, during the war, and after the war. She was an experienced puppeteer, and she was a Jewish actress, although not an actress in the Jewish theater. She was a Russian and Ukrainian-speaking actress at Kiev's State Puppet Theater under the Kiev Palace of Pioneers and School Children in the name of Panas Lubchenko the puppet theater, which performed largely in Ukrainian. Yet Dina Pronicheva never appears in scholarship on Ukrainian theater. Her theater career never brought her the kind of fame that tends to attract scholars. And theater scholarship tends to categorize by ethnicity, analyzing Ukrainian, Russian, Yiddish, Polish theater separately, even though the theaters themselves are actually quite multi-ethnic. Yet on the other hand, scholars of the Holocaust never delve into her theatrical context and rarely treat the two years of her wartime experience after her survival in Babinyar that were spent in Ukrainian theater under Nazi occupation. Breaking these scholarly categories and placing Dina Pronicheva in the historiography of Ukrainian theater, and in particular Ukrainian theater under Nazi occupation, requires analyzing her as a theater professional and not just as a survivor. This theatrical context brings the Jewish experience to Ukrainian theater history. And in turn, shows how the Ukrainian context shifts our understanding of Jewish theater in Ukraine. And finally, I want to suggest that a theatrical context, including a performance studies lens, reveals the very physicality of her experience, the embodied nature of theater, the demands of daily performance, both on stage and off, and the embodied nature of survival and the knowledge that her body itself must have carried. So let me tell Dina Pronicheva's story above Yar, her survival story, through the lens of theater. And I'm moving here actually from this filmed testimony um, to this document here, the stenogram of her testimony given later in April 1946 to the Commission on the History of the Great Patriotic War. <laughs> 
It's this 20-page testimony that shows how Babinyar was only the beginning of her survival story. And this is my primary source for this talk. She remained alive for over two years, from October 1941 until December 1943, when the Kiev region was liberated. As her testimony shows, theater helped her survive these two years, or rather, her survival was intertwined with the theater, dependent on her network of connections from her career and her skills acquired as an actress. Looking at this theatrical experience itself highlights aspects of her story simply different from those that have been investigated in the quite extensive scholarship on the atrocities of Babinyar itself. So, at a certain point, around spring 1942, she walks on foot about 85 kilometers to Bilatsirkva. She finds that one of the Kiev theaters was there performing. I'm not sure which one this was, but as of October 1941, there were three dramatic theaters officially uh, working in Kiev, and all of them were touring. So one of these theaters, uh, she is in Bilatsirkva. She tells the administration that she's an evacuee, who would like to offer her services, and she's accepted. Moreover, one of the costumers recognizes her as a colleague from Kiev and offers her a room. Pronicheva notes that this costumer never knows that she was Jewish, right? And so she was so welcoming to offer her um, accommodation. While staying with the costumer for six weeks until the theater finished its tour and returned to Kiev, Pronicheva studied German, which would serve her later. Then a second theater from Kiev arrives in Milotsirkva, she says it is the Oblasnoi Tiat Imeni Shevchenka, and she had an old friend working there, Nikolai Tsigankov. Valery Haidebura, who has painstakingly compiled lists of theaters, repertory, workers for the period of Nazi occupation, actually notes a Miski Tiat Imeni Shevchenka in Kiev. And I assume that this is the theater, that this Oblasnoi is actually the Miski, um, since an N Tsigankov is listed as one of those actors. The next images that you'll see are, are also digitized um, from Babin Yad archive. They're from Dako, the Dejami Archikisko Oblasti. And so one thing I did was check the names in this testimony and found most of them actually in these, in these card catalogs, which sort of grounds her, grounds her testimony. And this particular theater, this Miski Teatri Mishachanka, uh, apparently ran into censorship problems in winter 41, and actually split into different groups run by different artists. So it would make sense that this Tsugankov um, took a group of artists to Bilatsirkva and was trying to, to run um, the theater there. He actually pretends not to know her, um, as she explains, pretends not to know she's Jewish, and actually takes her into his house and supports her. But such connections from before the war could also bring danger. Another Kiev actress, and Nadezhda Kaltsova, arrives at the theater, also looking for work, recognizes her, and gives her up as Jewish. But Pronicheva was saved from Kaltsova's denunciation by a technical worker, machinist Zani, Grigory Afanasyev, whose Jewish wife and baby had recently been shot. He was sympathetic to her, and he stated that anyone accusing Pronicheva will have to deal with him in the Dila. Somehow this threat works, I don't know how, but somehow it does. And she continues working at this theater for the rest of the German occupation. And Afanasia becomes the new source of support, helping her negotiate a very complicated position as a Jewish artist in the Ukrainian theater under occupation. But it's not only her network of supporters, but her own talents that help her survive. She notes that she worked as an artist, administrator, and ticket taker, that she would do anything to stay in the theater. And actually, she must have been an asset to the theater company. Given Kaltsova's what seems to be very open denunciation, many of the artists and technical personnel could have known she was Jewish. Anyone could have denounced her at any time. But it was somehow in their interest to keep her employed and, and not give her over to the authorities. She makes use of her acting skills not only on the stage, but also off stage throughout her time employed in this theater. In one segment of her testimony, she describes witnessing the Holocaust. So she's not only a survivor, she's a witness. In summer 1943, the theater tours, as theaters do in summer, to Ruzhen, which is in uh, Chitomir Oblast, uh, west from Bilotsirpa, 
where there was a Jewish ghetto with 38 Jews remaining. They were working in a tailoring factory. And in order to help them, Pronicheva tears her skirt on purpose and demands that the Jews fix her skirt before the evening's performance, which gives her an excuse to connect um, with the Jewish community for whom she's managed to purchase some food hidden by the skirt in a basket. So she brings the skirt, but then hidden in it are some goods from the market. Her friend Athanasiev helps her with this ruse by distracting the local guards, talking with them, promising tickets for the evening's performance, so that she is able to sneak this basket of goods into the ghetto to help the Jews of Ruzhin. Clearly, this gambit required acting skill. The story does not end happily, of course. She concludes this episode by saying that the district commissioner, Gavitz Komisar, showed up and ordered the ghetto liquidated. She and the other members of the theater company watched the Jews rounded up, taken away, and shot. She writes, they took them all before our eyes and shot them right away, which we all saw. Performing this role of a non-Jewish actress required incredible skill. At one point, Pronicheva had to be a conferencier in German. So this is the MC of a variety show that introduced acts, um, has some improvised jokes, right, describes what's happening. All of these theaters not only did um, plays, but always had a variety show evening, which seems to have been aimed at um, the occupying forces. Uh, variety entertainment was a part of life under occupation. And so Dina Pronicheva, a Jewish survivor of Babin Yar, was an MC in German for the Nazis. She did not want to do this for fear of being found out. She was worried about her German. But the managing director of the theater, Vasil Prignanko, knew she was Jewish and threatened to denounce her if she refused. Somehow the self-taught German she acquired while staying with that costumer in summer 1942 made it possible for her to pull up this feet. And she worked at this theater until the end of 43 when Kiev was liberated and she could return to the city. And theater remained a source of continuity for her. From 1944, she rejoined the Kiev Puppet Theater, about which more later. So through her testimony given in 46, we see not only the ways she played the role of a non-Jewish theater professional, but also the ways in which theater simply constituted her wartime experience. This narrative of theater and survival shifts three interconnected historiographies, Ukrainian theater history, Jewish history, and the embodied nature of theater. So we'll take each of these one by one. So first, reading Ukrainian theater through Dina Pronicheva. Scholars of Ukrainian theater, such as Svetlana Maksimenko and Maya Harbozyuk, point to the ways in which average artists were able to preserve Ukrainian culture even in the most extreme conditions during the war. And this is very important. In most theaters, the repertory performed was 19th century classic Ukrainian melodramas. Karpenko Kari, Krobotnitsky, Shevchenko, Kotlerevsky, um, with some European translations and some modern plays like Mikola Kulish's Mina Mazailo was, was performed a couple times, which is quite, quite interesting. Um, however, um, although we know the repertory largely from Haida Bura's work, we don't know this larger context of theater under occupation. But I think actually um, reading Dina Pronicheva, we can actually deepen our understanding of this theatrical life. Famously, Ukrainian actor and director Yosef Irnyak directed the first ever Ukrainian language performance of Hamlet, right here, at Lviv Opera Theater under the Nazis. It was translated by Bahalo Rubnitsky, who was an intellectual from a mixed Jewish-Ukrainian family. Irnyak was a former Benazil actor, a survivor of the Soviet Gulag, who during the war was able to escape the Soviets, make his way to Lviv, um, direct Hamlet, uh, and then he and his wife made it to the DP camps and finally made their way to America. Hirnyak writes years later in his memoirs, The Second World War was sort of a life raft. And it was for him. Yet this show took place a stone's throw away from the Yanovska camp, where the city's Jews were systematically murdered during the war. So we have a life raft and the destruction of an entire world happening at the same time. It seems like they're utterly disconnected, but actually we can bring them together. 
Dina Polnicheva was not the only Jewish artist to survive in the theater. Haidebura notes other Jewish artists who survived. For example, several worked in the Kleinkunsttheater, the theater of small forms, in Kiev as musicians, dancers. There was a violinist, apparently, who played with the Kiev opera. And finally, a Semyon Grusberg was attached to the Lviv Opera Theater, and he made these sketches, actually, of um, Josef Kutniak's Hamlet, and survived the war on their payroll as Grusbenko. And actually, if you look um, here, you can't really see on this um, photo, but in the very bottom, I, I think you can see Grusbenko, like you can see his, his name. So actually, this one guy, um, who's visible only in this little name, connects this Jewish story, right, with the story of um, Ukrainian um, theater. And these cases brought forward by Khadabura plus my own study of Pronicheva suggest there's probably more. Um, there are probably be more Jewish artists who are hiding in plain sight. And all of these cases point to the fact that probably people around them knew they were Jewish, and somehow to the authorities they passed as non-Jews. Pronicheva's testimony also shows that Ukrainian companies literally witnessed the murder of local Jewish communities in the towns in which they were performing. Art and violence, quite simply, were not separate. And this is actually true in the Civil War years um, as well. Uh, famously, Los Kurbas and his company, the Kidram Tau, were performing in Bilotsirkva, Uman region. Um, and there's one moment in particular where he makes a comment um, that shows that they're all very aware of the anti-Jewish violence that has been happening um, in the region. And it's important to remember, too, that um, while the presence of Pronicheva or these other Jewish artists in these theaters under Nazi occupation is shocking to us now, right? We think, oh my gosh, theater under Nazi occupation, these Jewish artists. Theaters in the Soviet period were multi-ethnic. It would, it would not have been perceived as strange before the war that Jewish, Ukrainian, Russian um, artists, as defined on their passports, all worked together. No one would have thought that was strange. But ethnicity became a weapon for use in a time of war. And this kind of um, pragmatic anti-Semitism might differentiate these theaters from other theaters under occupation. For example, Omelian Urbanski ran a theater under Nazi occupation in Shamashol, which is a different region, right? It's the Krakow region of the general government, um, not a region that had been part of Soviet Ukraine. Given his proximity to Nazi power, his album contains copies of letters from the Nazi party supporting him and his wife as they were um, evacuating with the Germans leaving Przemysl. It might have been more difficult to hide in plain sight in this theater. But I'm not sure. I only assume that theaters under occupation probably vary depending on the experiences and people involved. And the point is that these stories of Jewish artists in Ukrainian language theaters in the war reveals the diversity of experiences making theater during the war and the intertwining of this diversity. These are not separate stories, right? It's one very complicated story of war. And this diversity characterized the post-war puppet theater as well, which Pranicheva rejoined in 1944. Maria Tobolevich Krasan was the adopted daughter of Ivan Kopengokari and Sofia Tobolevich. Um, she was Sofia's daughter, and then Ivan Kopenkokari um, adopted her. She studied French in Paris. She was a teacher. She was devoted to children. She was tried during the famous Esvau trial in 1929, and apparently exiled out of the Soviet Union for 10 years, um, and came back to Kiev only in 1941. I want to say here I'm a little vague on her story. I've looked a lot. Um, for sort of a, a fuller biography of her, and I haven't found it. So if anyone knows, please tell me. Um, in any case, um, uh, under occupation, she actually founded um, a sewing school for girls in Kiev, and under its auspices, a puppet theater for young children. And she hired people to help with the theater, which helped them survive, of course. So through hiring teachers and hiring artists, She's actually kind of helping a network of people um, to survive. One such was Maria Sklarova, who was an actress who had studied with Kurbas at Berezil um, and also had been involved in puppet theater before the war. Maria Tobilevich miraculously 
kept this institution going during occupation. She managed to get it officially approved under the Germans. They had a German come by and check and make sure they were um, not doing anything that wasn't legal. It survived. Um, shows they did included Gogol's Nietzsche Rizdvon, Verpap, uh, and Liz Mokita. At the end of the war, when the Germans were leaving, she saw, sought safety with her husband, Andri Kresan, who had spent the war in Bilatsirfa. Did she see Pronicheva there? Did he see Pronicheva there? Did he see her shows? We don't know the answer to these questions, but I think the proximity between these wartime experiences is of no. When the Soviets liberated Kiev, Sklerova advocated not only for the reestablishment of state-managed puppet theater, but also for Tabelevich Kresan to run it. The Soviets somehow let her run the theater, um, which is very interesting, right, because she'd worked under occupation, she actually was receiving a small stipend um, under the Germans, and yet the Soviets let her continue running this theater, um, and Sklerova was able to continue as director. Joining the troupe was Raisa Margolina, who had been one of the major designers and puppet makers from before the war and had spent the war in evacuation in Central Asia. So at this theater in Kyiv, in 1944, before the war's over, was a survivor of Babin Yar who performed for the Germans, Pronicheva, a Ukrainian theatrical protege who survived occupation in Kyiv, Tabelevich Krasan, an actress who performed under occupation but largely for Ukrainian children, Sklerova, and a Jewish artist who'd survived an evacuation in Central Asia, Margolina. All worked together at this theater. And from 1945, the theater performed in the Karayat Synagogue, a formerly Jewish space, of course. So all of these stories are interconnected. So what about reading Jewish experience through the Ukrainian theater? Just as examining Pronicheva's survival through theater highlights different aspects of Ukrainian theater history, focusing on Jewish theater itself through Pronicheva's story highlights a really different trajectory of Jewish theater, especially in Ukraine. The Soviet state murdered Solomon Mikhoyls in 1948, and Yiddish theaters throughout the Soviet Union closed shortly thereafter. State Yiddish Theater of Ukraine, then working in Chernivtsi, was no exception. It closed in 1950. And most scholars consider this the end of Yiddish theater in the Soviet Union. And in a literal sense, of course, it was. But when we draw Dina Pronicheva into this story, we have to change our terms and our categories. Theater in the Yiddish language ended with Mikhail's murder, with some exceptions. But Yiddish theater is often equated with Jews or Jewish theater, and that's not correct. Jews continued working in theaters throughout Soviet Ukraine. And in fact, Jews worked in non-Yiddish theaters in Soviet Ukraine before the war. It's true that I haven't found um, Jewish actors at the preeminent Ukrainian language theater, the Berezil, although um, several musicians in that company were Jewish. But many Jews, like Polonicheva, didn't work in the Yiddish theater. Why would they? There's no need to. Soviet Ukraine had a rich theatrical landscape that was multi-ethnic. Theater was institutionally separated by ethnicity, but in fact, in the archives, one finds countless stories of crossover, hybridity, mixing, typical of a diverse ethnic landscape. So let's examine Pronicheva through Ukrainian theater history. Let's put her in this chronology. So she's born in 1911. So she would have been in theater school around 1931, 29, 30, 31. The puppet theater in Kyiv was founded in 1927. Under the auspices of the Theater of Young Spectators by Oksandr Solomarsky, he's in the middle there, and Irina Dayeva. She's actually a really interesting woman who's in my book. Um, she's a well known director um, who counted among her achievements creating a training program for actors in the Polish theater studio. She's the only Polish theater studio in the entire Soviet Union. She's very cool. In 1931, Zinaida Pichulowicz took over. She was the only woman to study directing with Ukrainian theater innovator Les Kurpas. She's pictured here um, in the middle. And in 1934, the theater split kind of into an itinerant troupe um, and the, sort of the more official theater that in 1936 moved to Khrushchevsky Street, where the theater is actually located today. Pronicheva performed there. After the war, the theater played in the former Karayat Synagogue on Yaroslav Val, was run by Tobilevich Krasan. In 53, the theater moved locations to the former Brodsky Synagogue on Rustaveli Street. The theater was moved out of that synagogue in 1997, 
And in 2005, they returned back to that Hushevsky Street, that 1936 location. You don't need to follow all of that. But all of this is to say, she was a puppet theater actress, contains an entire world of people and institutions and achievements. As a student in Kiev in the 1930s, she would have seen those puppet theater productions, which were lauded at an all-union level, winning prizes, and where artists known only in Ukrainian theater history, like Veyeva Pikhalovich, worked. Her career was deeply entwined with people and institutions more well known by scholars of Ukrainian theater. And scholars of Jewish history do not include her work with Ukrainian theater legends in their analysis because theater seems far from Babinya. It is, of course. And yet to understand her story requires investigating not only atrocity but also the arts. She was, in fact, deeply a part of the network of Soviet Ukrainian theater, very particular to this place in its multi-ethnicity, the artistic genealogy of its institutions, and its people. Moreover, what the existence of that network suggests is that Jewishness in Soviet Ukrainian theater did not end after Mikhail's. Yiddish theater ended, but not Jews in theater. And in fact, tracing a network of connections between Jewish artists, non-Jewish artists, and various institutions shows that perhaps one of Soviet Ukraine's specificities is the density of connections between them. Because of the murder of audiences and artists during the Holocaust, focus on this, um, this dense network of artists and institutions has been limited, right? Um, and it's largely not visible today. But tracing these um, connections shows that while Yiddish theater may have ended, the artists, directors, and designers who survived the war often had long careers in Soviet Ukraine, bringing their experiences to new theatrical institutions. So let me give you a few examples. So first, um, this is a great um, photo of her in the puppet theater before the war. Um, uh, so here's a few examples. So this is Anna Scheinfeld, um, an actress in the state Yiddish theater, so Yiddish theater actress. Then she was transferred to Lviv. And she worked in the musical comedy theater, run at the time by Isaac Grinspoon, who's also Jewish. In 1953, as some of you may know, this company was transferred to Odessa in exchange for the theater of the Odessa Military District, former, formerly the theater of the Kiev Military District and a frontline theater during the war, moving to Lviv and becoming the theater of the Carpathian Military District, which is now Teatr Lesi in a totally different form. But Schenkfeld didn't move to Odessa. So she was here in the musical comedy theater, she didn't go to Odessa, she stayed here, and she got a job at the Lviv Puppet Theater. So she also worked with puppets after the war. When she was at the musical comedy theater, though, Schenkfeld would have crossed paths with Zina Dekaryova, who had joined the company after graduating from school in Odessa, and who also wouldn't go back to Odessa, but remain at the theater of the Carpathian Military District, where she would become essentially its leading actress. So we see a connection between the state Yiddish theater, its former artists, and three theaters in Lviv, musical comedy, which becomes military district, and the puppet. Never mind Anatoly Rutenstein, the artistic director for 20 years of the theater of the Carpathian Military District, who survived the war with his mother outside Kiev and joined the Red Army in 43, which means he survived the Holocaust, by the way, although he's never categorized as a survivor. What were his war stories? Or we could take Leah Buchova, who was a star of the State Yiddish Theater in Odessa. But she left it. She joined the theater of the Kiev Military District when it was performing on the Stalingrad front. And she'd actually joined the Russian language theater in Odessa before the war, complaining, um, actually in a, in a letter to Khrushchev, about a lack of new roles for women in Yiddish theater. The military theater returned from the front was stationed in Odessa in 1944 where it took up residence in the building formerly occupied by Bukova's former home, the State Yiddish Theater of Odessa. So the military theater moves into the home of the State Yiddish Theater. She transfers back to the non-military stage. She spends a long career in Odessa performing, teaching, and as an anti-Zionist activist. This density of connections suggests the ways that the trauma of the Holocaust must have impacted the theatrical world of Soviet Ukraine since Jews were a part of not only Yiddish theater, but also theaters across Soviet Ukraine. Bukova mentions in a newspaper editorial 
her 14 family members murdered during the war, especially a beloved sister. And Albert Stolsky, one of the older members of the State Yiddish Theater, also stayed in Lviv. And he joined the theater of the Carpathian Military District as an administrator. And when Bukova comes to tour to Lviv many years later, she and Stolsky meet and they cry. So the connections between these artists across these different companies remain. But of course, the war shaped all artists who survived the war in ways that I think are difficult now to access or articulate. In an interview, um, actually from a collection here at the Center for Urban History, an actress from Lviv's puppet theater mentions Anna Sheinfeld. And she notes that there was a kind of other relations between Sheinfeld and another non-Jewish actress because as this interviewee explains, they'd all lived through the war. It's a really vague comment, they'd all lived through the war, but I think it suggests the myriad ways that wartime experiences, Jewish and not, must have shaped the post-war theater. And I think this dense network of connections between Jewish, Ukrainian, and Russian artists is a marker of Ukraine, one of the specificities of this place. So finally, I would like to highlight what reading Pronicheva's testimony through the lens of performance studies gives us for our understanding of theater and trauma. So first, thinking about the very physicality of theater helps us understand the complexity of intimacy and survival. I think the extraordinariness of her story. Theater demands bodily contact. Undressing, dressing, putting on makeup, taking on makeup in dressing rooms, backstage sweating on the stage under the lights, traveling in close quarters in vans to a touring location. Everyday moments demand this bodily, intimate connection. Second, I'd like to draw in Diana Taylor's work on Latin America. Um, she's a performance studies scholar, and she shows how local knowledge is preserved through folk festivals and rituals, which may never show up in the archives. So bodies, she argues, carry as much knowledge as archival documents. And she asks, how does performance transmit knowledge about the past in ways that allow us to understand it and to use it? So for example, Kathy Carruth, um, a scholar of trauma, writes that Katzeknik's famous fall when he fainted while giving testimony in the Eichmann trial, right? He's speaking, giving his testimony, and he faints, was a moment of his body actually conveying knowledge. She writes, the act of transmission is thus a means of passing on, through the drama of human testimony, the impact of an unimaginable history. So actually that physical move conveyed knowledge. So how do we imagine what the body might pass on? Pronicheva's written testimony becomes Diana Taylor's archive. That's, we can read the document. But the deeper bodily experience becomes, as she says, the repertoire, the embodied knowledge from, in this case, traumatic experience. Daria Tsimbaliu wrote in 2022 in Nature about the importance of the contemporary Ukrainian researcher's body as archive that scholars should pay attention to instead of ignore and push aside their physical experience of watching, living through, and writing about Russia's war in Ukraine. So how might we read that epistemology of the body into the past using our archival documents and our imagination? So Diana Taylor's talking about the present, but how do we read that sense of embodiedness into the past when it might not really be written in our documents? Let's consider the physicality, the way Pony of a story inscribes itself on her body the arm that was stepped on by the German boot, the feet that made it to Vilatsirkva, the body that was full of scars, the eyes and ears that witnessed the murder of the Russian Jews, her mind and her mouth learning, remembering, pronouncing German words as a conferencier. The testimony, in fact, actually has a deeply physical aspect in her choice of verbs and the way she describes her survival. Finally, her testimony notes that at the end of the war, she is linked up with, she uses the phrase, skatorum sashis, stage worker Grigory Afanasyev. After liberation, he, 
like many, joined the Red Army and went to fight in the war, and returned home wounded. And this fact of the connection between Pranichava and Afanasyev adds another um, embodied dimension to her story. Her life changed in horrible and traumatic ways, and she met her second husband. And I'll note, actually, he's there, um, down on the left. Um, in the description in the Babinyar archive, they give him the last name Tikhanich, but actually from his, the card in the card catalog, um, it does say Grigory, like, Tikhanich Afanasyev. So it's that guy, that's, that's, that's Afanasyev. Um, and she describes how, at the end of the war, when he went to the front, she remained, she says, alone and naked, barefoot, without Afanasyev. She sewed a coat from a blanket. She's in such a poor physical state that she cannot take her children, even though miraculously she's found them, which is another very physical description of finding her children. Even in 1946, when she gives her testimony, written down in that stenogram, she's unable to have her children live with her. So two years later, she still can't have her children, which makes us realize the extraordinary physical strength that must have been required to give that filmed testimony in January 1946. And her return to the puppet theater in 1944, returning to work while still naked, barefoot, with her coat sewn from a blanket and unable to care for her children, is all the more striking. But theater was central to her life. Her last line, how she chooses to end her testimony, is, I work in the Kiev Republican puppet theater as a leading actress. That's how she chooses to end her story. So thinking about the body also raises questions about repertoire and what the meaning of this repertoire was for Prunicheva and also for other artists and the audiences, both locals and Germans. Theater scholar Marvin Carlson notes the ghost machine quality to theater, that people perform a play again and again, and it requires meaning by this iterative performance. So the striking majority of the plays performed by theaters under occupation were plays from this 19th century era of Ukrainian melodrama. And I wonder if or how that ghost machine factor shaped artists and audiences' engagement with these plays, right? These are plays written under the yoke of the Russian Empire, when the empire declared Ukrainian was not a language, yet they were beloved by their audiences and were allowed to be performed under the Germans. What was it like for Ponicheva to perform this repertory? What was the resonance of this repertory with its different populations and with her, hiding as a Jewish actress in Ukrainian theater? It's hard to answer because in her testimony there's no discussion of repertory, no discussion of casting or directorial choices or audience response. Theater is a backdrop. It's a pathway for survival. The liquidation of the Ruzhin ghetto becomes more important than the repertory they were performing in Ruzhin. But we have to ask, I think, what might have been the connection between the two. After all, it is Pronicheva herself who is performing and who assisted the Jews in the ghetto. She literally, physically, in her body, links the repertory and the archive in Taylor's theoretical sense, or the onstage, the repertory, and the offstage, the wartime experience. But let us return to puppets. How are puppets a part of this story? The puppet cannot lie, said Oleksii Kravchuk, artistic director of Beauty Love Key, in an interview. The puppet is a paradoxical object. It slows down emotion through its sequence of physical gestures. It is an object, it's not alive. But it can so easily convince an audience of life that these puppets are just as alive as the invisible actors who manipulate them. By the 1950s, dramatic theaters across the Soviet Union were presenting plays about the war, crafting a monumental and unifying narrative about heroes and victims and sacrifice and morality. It's not clear to me how much of that narrative existed in the puppet shows. Um, Liz Makita, Chavona Shapka, where the plays mentioned um, a lot, were fairy tales telling of good and evil, to be sure. Perhaps those stories of foxes and princes and girls were meant to remind their young audiences of a world without war, or to frame a world with war in such a way they could figure out how to live in it. These plays, too, had also been performed before the war and during the war, so how did their meaning shift, if at all? And what did it mean for Dina to return to her puppets? In a sense, I think of how the puppets protected the artists. You can even see that in this photo, 
Um, we see the puppets in the foreground and the artists in the background. The body was not directly open to the audience's eyes, judgment, and ears. The puppet served as a kind of barrier or intermediary between the artist and the audience. And yet, of course, to be a puppeteer requires the body, demands its entire engagement. But Dina Pronicheva never spoke about her life as a puppeteer. We don't know about her professional world, how she returned to work, how she worked with her peers with different wartime experiences, what role she played under occupation, how she experienced those stories, and the stories her puppets, those brought to life by her arms and her torso, told post-war audiences. I've put her testimony here in a theatrical context, but much remains silent. She chose to speak about some aspects of her life and not about others. So what do we do with those choices? At some point, I could go to Kiev. I could choose to sift through the files on the puppet theater at Zdamlim, and I could hope to find her. I could sift through the files of the puppet theater in Lviv, fascinating stories there, including of this other Jewish puppeteer, Anna Sheinfeld. But I don't think those sources will help me answer what deeply concerns me, which is how the trauma of war shaped the body, the ways that artists use their bodies and their work, and the meaning that that conveyed to audiences, this embodiedness of theater in the past. So perhaps our challenge as scholars is to listen to the physicality of sources, to use our imagination, but to use it ethically, in order to grasp the complexity of people's lives. Dina Pronicheva's life was complex. She wasn't just a survivor at Babinyad, but a part of a rich world of theater in Soviet Ukraine. That world helped her survive, albeit in complicated ways, and she returned to it after the war. Hers was a life lived in theater, and her life makes us think about theater in Ukraine, and about Jewish history in Ukraine, and about embodied experience in new ways. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much um, for this um, lecture and for this opportunity to see Dina Pranicheva because um, I guess a few years ago we had a lecture on the Baban Yar by Karl Bakhoff and Dina Pranicheva was featured because she's a key Yes, yes, and there's an article about the, the, the various experiences of uh, Baban Yar. But when we study, you know, when, when we look at uh, studies of the Holocaust, it's so important to see the lives. And I guess that is, the, that is what, um, what your lecture gives us and what we can um, develop. And this, this unfolding, this developing, uh, is... is, is uh, for the, for this we owe you thanks. I'm still I'm still I'm still collecting my thoughts because really there's a lot of this is also quite emotional. I guess I'll be coming back to this, but I wanted to ask maybe there are que perhaps there are questions. The earliest question I see Ira. Yes, I'll uh, please give her the microphone and we'll we'll talk. Yes, thank you very much for this very inspiring story, and especially how you um, frame, uh, you, set, you set this story in a completely different context that, yes, is well known to all scholars only in the context of, you know, witness and reconstructing facts of Bab and Yar. But also, there is the study on the difference in her stories in, over the decades, the various uh, testimony in various contexts. And the, do these materials help you or has, has she addressed um, her theatrical identity, her professional identity, and her other uh, later testimonies uh, over the subsequent de decades? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so, yeah, Carl Berkhoff has this article where he really details, I think it's 10 different versions um, of, her, of her testimony, um, both the one at the January trials, the April stenogram, and then later she gives testimony at... Um, the Carlson trial in Darmstadt, um, uh, 
Anatoly Kuznetsov, right, takes some of her, her, her story and puts it in, in his book. Um, none of the other testimonies, to my knowledge, in none of the other testimonies is she asked about or does she talk about this two-year period where she's in the theater. Um, I actually went to great lengths to find this Carlson um, uh, transcript. Um, uh, every scholar will understand this. You know, you can't travel to Munich, so you sort of search down every place it could be. And um, it actually was published in German in the journal Ost Europas. Um, so I, you know, was able to access it and and read it. And indeed, it's which makes sense. It's a trial of specific perpetrators, so they're only interested in Babinia. They're not interested in, in her kind of telling the rest of the story of how she survived. I think that commission was more interested in these long-term stories of survival. Um, so this is the only place that I know of that she talks about her time in theater. There could be others, and I just haven't found them, but to my knowledge, this is it. Um, is it the sh uh, question? Yes. Mayhill, thanks uh, for this great uh, lecture, particularly um, the fact that you mentioned how to interpret uh, archive, how to use the body as, as archive. But I have a question on sort of classical sources, you know, texts. It seems to me that. Um, you know, history, much as history as such, to a large extent, is written on sources, texts of people who either experienced violence or perpetrated violence. And in in your lecture, you talk about needing to decenter this experience of physical violence. And it's interesting to me. How, how do you read? How do you read the sources of people who either perpetrated or experienced violence, considering? specifically this physical experience of violence that they um, went through. So it's a very interesting concept, but I, I'm interested how, do you, how does that practically work? I mean, how do we take um, this violence that people went through, uh, conveyed into text, and how do we draw it from the text? And what, what, what does it give us in terms yeah, of the resources? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question. And actually, um, I didn't in this talk um, that I'm hoping to figure out a way in the chapter to bring in this, um, I think, this larger question of how we talk about the body and these experiences. And um, obviously her experience in the ravine, it is an experience of physical violence. There's no interpretation or sort of performance studies frame needed for that at all, right? But interestingly, there's a moment where she, um, you know, she's there for like three days, over three days, and she sees things and then passes out essentially. And I think that's actually very interesting. That in fact, you don't need this performance studies lens for that. Maybe this Kathy Carew stuff about trauma. That actually, when we look at some of these physical moments, we do catch a glimpse of the incredible trauma of that, of that situation. Um, and then I think, um, you know, when immediately when she leaves the ravine and she spends this odd day or several days where she's essentially pretending to be um, some sort of non-Jewish local woman who can be a servant to the Germans who are there. I mean, it's this incredible story. Um, when we take into account the violence she's just experienced to her body, it suddenly becomes extraordinary, and we need to explain how she's able to do that. You know, And so I think um, you're right that one can't sort of theor theoretize the reality but I think that sometimes the theory helps us understand the extraordinariness of the reality, or, or it highlights things that do need to be explained. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, because um, there are different... There, there are many questions to which you, for which you don't have sources. 
in the case of Dina, uh, there are quite many, quite a few of them. In addition to, um, in addition to testimony, there's the family archive, and you've, met, you've, you've used many of the photographs. So when you looked through these photographs and you selected some for this lecture, um, how how is that? Not just the decision to have photographs or to collect these photographs into this album, this other album. I mean than the album that you that you that you had in Cleveland that you ran, ran into in Cleveland that you worked with in Cleveland and it's also family uh, story family story family history so we have the story of a witness of a survivor of an actress but also a family and what what of this, how do you work, because this archive that is kind of extracted from a family space and it's now part of the digital space and it's part of um, an archive of the Holocaust. And we see too how certain categories are, how they, how they cut short, how particular categories cut short certain stories, but do not also the places where we find these documents, or in this case, well, the screen, how how they also create a, create a frame, or or vice versa, force force us to push to push this frame. Maybe maybe if you have. Something I mean, to say I feel like that. you you said it quite well. So I would just Isn't say. No, maybe I'm just going to. Sophia Jackson. Yes. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So um, many of these photos are from a family photo album that Bolduin with the son gave obviously, to the foundation um, for digitization. Um, you, can, you can go there yourselves. Um, there are some very, uh, there's these photos, and there's also pages, like literally from the album, where they put together photos and newspaper articles about her. Um, uh, and it obviously is the way that um, he sees his mother, and he sees um, her story. Um, uh, you know, there are many um, uh, internet articles where he speaks about his mother and about her experience, and so it seems like for him, she is a Holocaust survivor, and and he very much, um, you know, he obviously and his sister had very difficult experiences in this early childhood experiences um, during the war. Obviously, they survived. Um, but, um, you know, uh, it was traumatic for them as, as small children and obviously for her. Um, and, and so that very much marks their archive. I think um, they would probably be surprised that a researcher is writing on her as, a, as an actress. Um, that is not how they really framed her. Um, uh, and yet it's how I'm seeing her. And of course, when I see these photos, particularly this one, um, as a theater scholar, I mean, I love it. Um, and I had to do all this research on the difference between marionette theaters and hand um, theaters and um, sort of the story of, of puppet theater um, in Ukraine. So that's my take on, on this archive, but, but I don't think it's their take. That's not how they're you know, creating the story of um, of their mother. Um, and so, absolutely, the places that we find these, these documents create their own frames, right? The archive defines some of the questions that you ask. Um, uh, and, and, and how those questions come up, I, um, you know, if I were working on Dina Ponejeva, which I probably wouldn't have been, um, before this material was digitized, I mean, I would have had to go to Tzdaho and, and, and read it, and um, that would be a very different experience um, than downloading um, these, these documents and reading them on my laptop at home. Um, but I would say there's also something about um, the preciousness of being able to do that 
um, and particularly being able to do that in a time of war, right? Like I'm very aware of that's why this digitization is happening and why I'm not going to stumble and why I'm actually doing this, that I think makes you read differently. And that's what I was referring to at the beginning of my talk, that there were so many things that just occurred to me differently um, because of the war right now. I don't know that I would have thought so much about this at another time. Um, I don't know that, you know, there's something about having this document on my laptop that makes me come back to it again and again. In fact, um, here's a confession. Um, Grigory Afanasyev is a very interesting figure, major figure. And Skotorum Mishashlis. And it's like, we got together, like, I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. Um, and I did some researching on the internet, and that's how I found out he was the second husband. And then I checked this photo, and I checked the Kartotaka, and I was able to put those dots together. Um, but it was only the, um, uh, the ability to, and the necessity of, lingering with a document for a really long time um, that I think may be able to do that. Had it been a classic summer archival research trip where I was trying to get as much as possible, right, and looking at this, and looking at this, and looking at this, and looking at this, and having all these like, scans, I'm not sure I would have, um, I'm not sure I would have had that imagination to really um, generously and hopefully humbly kind of think about her world seriously in, that, in the same way. Um. Follow up question that's so a bit of a follow-up question to this because the article will come out and I guess next year you'll be back and possibly we'll go to Kyiv or you'll go to Kyiv. Would you like to go to Dstavo and see and, 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 and leaf through the undigitized copies of these documents? No, actually, I, I don't, I don't but, I would, but I, would, I would really like to go to Dstamlim and see where she shows up in the files on the puppet theater in Stumlin. They have them there. She's there. I'm sure she's there. I would love to see what her status was and the budgets and literally with the cast lists. And I would love, I would love to see that. Um, uh, so that I would like to sort of fill out um, that story. Um, and I think I would say also as a scholar in theater, I've been studying theater in Ukraine since 2005, and there's always more to study. And what just seems amazing to me is that you can keep studying and there's always something else. And um, uh, there's always sort of new, um, new things to be interested in. And, and um, so it's really, yes, the next time we have an archival trip in Kiev, there'll be a lot to study. Uh, Yes, thank you, Mehel. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. And um, I, you know, I think this is a very interesting um, way to rethink, attempt to rethink the history of theater, a history of survival of German occupation in the Second World War. But right now it's uh, taking on a different dimension because we're also living through a time of war. There's occupation, there's the story of life uh, of people who ended up in occupation the story of cultural institutions of people, people working in cultural institutions. And one of the subjects that is being discussed in Ukraine is the top, is theme of collaboration, right? And this, this, we indeed use the term. And I have this very amateur question because I'm, I'm actually not a scholar of the Second World War. But this, 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 the topic of collaboration obviously remains important and remains important how we discuss the various survival strategies, collaboration, cooperation during the war all these different strategies and how does this story how does this story the story of this woman this Jew, uh, Jewish survivor in Babad Yar how does it change our understanding uh, of these things the survival collaboration um, the work in the Ukrainian theater uh, under German occupation and the theater that worked also the theater that also worked for the German soldiers, right? You describe, you know, that she was forced to do so. She did it under duress, but 
nevertheless, if we're talking about, I mean, what, what terminology do we use? I mean, is it is it collaboration? How does it change your understanding of these various? Uh, how does it change your writing about all these in your texts? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Thank you so much. Um, so. Um, It is a question. So in the Second World War, the issue of um, obviously what people did during the war was greatly discussed and a huge issue after the war, right? We know this. Um, theater and the arts is no exception, right? Um, there were artists who worked um, under Nazi occupation who were then sent to the gulag. As in, as, as in any other profession, right? That absolutely happened. Um, there were artists who, who worked, right? Like this Maria Tobolevich Kurasan. I mean, she worked under the Germans and she's working under the Soviets. There's an actress um, here in Lviv, several actors who worked in that theater under the Nazis and then picked up their new jobs under the Soviets. It, it really seems to have depended on a wide variety of factors that again are not specific to theater but, but true for other, other fields as well. Certainly the discourse around collaboration was one of, it was a discourse of collaboration, right? A discourse of, it was bad to have done this, the good people did that, right? A very harsh discourse. And yet, um, when you look at people's stories, as you can imagine, it was so much more complex, right? This is perhaps an extreme example of complexity, right? Uh, but, but there were many people who, you know, we're taking care of an elderly parent and missed the train to Central Asia, and then there wasn't a train, and then they were stuck, right? Or people like Josip Hrnyak, who hadn't had a good experience under the Soviets, and so thought, I'll try this, right? Um, or people who were not given an option to leave, and then had to make their way, right? Um, and so, in fact, um, uh, uh, a wide variety and a wide strategy of wide strategies of survival um, were absolutely there, um, and yet the discourse after the war was very what's good, what's bad, right? Um, and I think you know one thing that um, that reading about the Second World War did for me, at least, um, is. Or that, that, that actually reading about the war today and hearing all your stories, my friends' stories, made me read those documents differently. That, for example, um, there are theaters performing right now under Russian occupation. And we don't know those stories. We know some of them. We know some of the repertory. Um, we know the artists working, but we don't know the full stories. Um, I hope someday we do, right? Um, theater is playing a role in the war. We know the role it's playing in Ukraine. Um, those of you who are here are probably interested in theater and following theater, so you know what's happening in Ukraine. It's an incredibly active sphere. There's amazing work being done. Um, uh, but recently I found that there is a, um, a a theater production that was also doc theater, witness theater, being made um, uh, by Russians in occupied territory and touring around Russia. So doing this own sort of story of witness theater of, of the other side. And so I think it's important to realize that theater is not apart from the war, it is a part of the war. It is where survival is happening. It is where choices are being made. Um, it's not separate from, from the war. And so I think, um, you know, turning our attention and thinking um, generously and with curiosity about what is the experience of theater under occupation is probably a really important thing, right? Um, I know there's a lot of documentation projects going on right now in Ukraine to try to get some of those stories, and I'm sure that there will be stories to tell, right, about the ways that the arts have survived here, here, right? But but also under occupation and what what those stories are. But it's definitely something to follow. Um.
And I guess because in listening to you and um, following your your research on what we we can put we can put a lot of questions to the sources, but it also gives us pause, makes us think about what questions we can ask now. Um, that what questions are we frightened of asking, and what questions perhaps we don't want to ask, but the understanding can sometimes hit us when 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 we think about stories from the past that uh, come so close. Thank you very much. If there are any more questions, yes, there are more. Qu two questions. Okay. No. Okay. There will be more things then. Right. Yes. Ira and and the first one. Yes. Someone who hasn't asked yet first. When I was um, on my way to this lecture, I was trying to find as much information as I could on Dina Pronicheva. I was very interested in her as a figure, as a theater worker, as a woman. And one aspects in her moments in her biography is when they're already walking the street to Babangyar. And then the story diverges here into three different branches, right? How exactly she found out what's going on beyond the wall. Um, first, that she herself realized what was going on. Secondly, is that she was approached by an old man who said, go, run away. And the third one is that her mom told her to go away, to run away. This is what I found. Perhaps there are more versions. And this is where the question arises of source as choice, right? How do you as a scholar, as a researcher in this way, what, what do you do? Where do you find this truth? And if you can... And if you know it's how, how it really question, happened, like can whole, you tell me? Right. Um, that's a, a very good question. How, having multiple sources, do we as scholars discern the truth? So there's two answers. One is, um, the direct answer to your question is very carefully. And there is this article um, by Karl Berkhoff, um, which is in a volume that I know is in the library, where he does that. He literally goes through, well, this account says this, this account says this, it seems like more this than probably this. He, d he does that work, and I think we all do that as scholars. We have different sources, and, and you put things together, and then you kind of use your best judgment to tell the story. So that's one answer. But I think the other answer is that um, uh, sometimes there's more than one truth. And, and actually what might be interesting is that there's differences in the way that she remembers that story. Right? Um, I mean, I think in the ways that we tell the stories of our lives, often we might tell things differently. Um, to one person than another person, or um, you know, if I describe something in my past, it might actually have really happen that way, but that is how I remember it. So what's right? Is what's right the way I'm remembering it now, or what actually happened? And I think there are certain moments in her testimony that are really interesting when they're the same, and also really interesting when they're different. And thinking about um, whether that difference is a product of of time, um, and, and how so. So I think when things are different, take note. But also as a historian, you can put together some ideas. I wanted to ask um, about this, the, the study of theater. I. It's, I'm very impressed by, by the, 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 the research that you're doing because it, it absolutely doesn't need, you know, just thinking about, you know, the renowned stars and achievements and create these hierarchies, you know, that it, what we should study in theater or art, that we should only study the, you know, the stars, the people who made a big contribution to particular arts, but we're talking about a completely different understanding. There's theatrical culture, there's connections, there's people, there's the theater going public, there's resources, institutions. So a completely different understanding of, uh, of uh, the study of theater. And 
it's really very interesting. These are aspects that make us really think differently on the study of theater. But on the other hand, because you're writing a book that uh, ought to be, I don't know, popular or important or sell, right? Thinking as a book, thinking in terms of a book, does that move you to finding, striking some kind of balance between the people that are interesting to a scholar as a student of uh, theater culture and people who will encourage who will draw attention, attention, who will be more attractive to those with a more conventional understanding of the history of theater, those who will be attracted by the great names, by the stars. Um, so how, how much does it matter? To what extent does it matter in thinking about specifically the publication? So on the first, you know, what a depressing question, but thank you so much. Um, uh, second, so um, thank you for this, this comment on the way I look at theater. Um, I'll make a little promotion, reclama, um, I actually have a course online at the Center for Urban History called Roshi Tamuza, Money in the Muse, and actually Oleksi Palanichka, who's here, has um, taken that course in the Kapitel Teatr um, at, uh, at Ivan Franco University that really sort of spreads out and unpacks my, my methodology of working on, on theater, so I'm glad it, I'm glad it struck you um, very much. Um, Books do have to sell. I think what's interesting is, you know, what do we mean by the great figures, right? Like, I wrote a book on Kurbas, but Kurbas doesn't sell in North American Slavic studies because no one knows about Kurbas, despite my awesome book, right? They still only know about Mirko, right? So Kurbas means something here, but it doesn't mean anything there. Um, so who, so, so who, for whom are certain figures big, right? Zankovatska's big here. She's in my book. Maybe she'll help sell it. But again, she, she won't help it sell um, in the United States. Um, and so, and maybe there's, a, maybe there's a benefit to that, actually. Um, at, um, uh, there's an article coming out in an edited volume by Oksana Keys. Um, based on a conference right here um, two years ago on women and, and modernity um, about two actresses, Hanna Babievna and Sofia Fedorceva, whom some people may kind of know about, maybe, but maybe not. But I think the story is more interesting than the actual people. And I think, I think there's a lot of times where we have stories that the story and the argument is more important than the actual names. Um, I think there's something maybe about the arts that makes us think like we have to have big names. Um, but I guess one thing I'm trying to do is by radically showing that it's not just about big names, it's about the institutions and the infrastructure and the money and the news and the audiences, that that is, that is where the story is. The story isn't in the queer bosses and, and the famous people, um, um, and the, the problem of selling that is a, is a problem that we all face. Yeah. <laughs> there will be a collection, they will all help each other out. Are there more comments, questions? Then I guess it's it's left for us to thank you. Thank you very much. And we we'll look forward to the book. The, both the book that will be translated and the book that is yet to be written and the article.